Okay, so here's a complete guide for anyone buying a computer or a Mac from Apple. So I'm gonna be going over every model and I'll say which kind of buyer should be buying which kind of computer. So let's start with the safest recommendation, basically the laptop that most people should be buying when you factor in value for money, and that's the M1 MacBook Air. Now you might be thinking, why not immediately recommend the M2 MacBook Air? It has the newer chip, the newer design with the notch, the nicer screen, and it's because the M1 MacBook Air is still a better deal. Yeah, it has the slightly thicker bezels, but most people aren't gonna care. It still has the older wedge shape, which I personally like less, but most people aren't gonna care. I could see some people actually preferring the wedge shape. And as a matter of fact, if we're comparing the base models of the M2 and M1 MacBook Airs, the M1 MacBook Air has slightly faster storage because of its dual SSD system that has the SSDs working in parallel, but the M2 MacBook Air doesn't have that tech. And with the M2 MacBook Air, you only get this parallel SSD system in the upgraded 512 gigabyte model of the MacBook Air. So if you're looking at the base models of the two laptops, the M1 is definitely the better choice. The new design and the notch and the better screen aren't worth 250 pounds or dollars extra. It's mainly for people who are doing pretty basic tasks like schoolwork or media consumption or maybe some coding or really light video editing. The battery life is really good, one of the best in any laptops actually, and the M1 is still a really good performing chip. And if you're gonna be using this laptop for a long time and you run a lot of apps in the background, you're probably gonna to wanna to opt for the 16 gigabytes of RAM model as well. That'll probably make your computer last longer and I expect a decent number of people are not gonna be happy with 256 gigabytes on the base model. So you might upgrade to the 512 gigabyte model, that's the next upgrade I would recommend. But if you're in the same kind of category of user as who's buying the M1 MacBook Air, the M2 MacBook Air is basically if you just have a little more money to spend, but still never get the base model of this laptop. Not only is the storage slightly slower than the M1, but 1,250 is just not worth it for a laptop with eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage. So you should probably upgrade those specs and maybe even start the second model with two extra GPU cores that's gonna have better graphics performance too. If you're in the market for this kind of laptop, the M2 chip is not gonna give you that many upgrades over the M1 chip. The performance increase is there, but it's not massive. Everything that's on the M2 MacBook Air is basically just a nice to have, like the new display and the new notch design. But what if specifically you're looking for better performance? That's exactly where the 13 inch MacBook Pro is meant to come in, but this is where you need to be careful because of some of the overlap with the 14 inch MacBook Pro. Because the chip inside the 13 inch MacBook Pro is the M1 chip, but the 14 inch MacBook Pro has a significantly better performing M1 Pro and M1 Max chips. My thought is that most people won't need the slightly better performance of the M2 chip over the M1. And if you really did need that much better performance, then you should just get a 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip. That does start at $1,900, which is pretty expensive for a base model laptop. But then again, that's a pretty normal price range for a higher end, more powerful laptop. So make sure you really do need the extra performance. I would say that includes stuff like video editing and photo editing. And then there's the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which supposedly has the same specs as the 14 inch MacBook Pro, but it has a bigger chassis. So it might perform better for longer without throttling because of the extra thermal headroom. Now that was all of the Apple laptops, but Apple more recently at least has been trying to extend their own Apple Silicon into their desktops as well. So let's start by talking about one of the more popular ones, which is the 24 inch M1 iMac. This computer has had one of the more controversial designs on any Apple computer. Most people who are tech heads are probably not gonna like this design because of how thick the bezels are and the fact that they're white. Not to mention the chin bar still exists, the stand doesn't have height adjustment, so there are some aesthetics and even functional problems. But other than that, this is a pretty decent, well-performing all-in-one, which is gonna last you a long time. And Apple's target audience with this computer was probably for like a family computer, you know, the ones that people keep in like the living room for everyone to use. At least that's what the ads suggest. And best of all, it starts at $1,250 or pounds, which isn't cheap, but it's the same price as the starting price of the M2 MacBook Air. And on top of that, you get a 4.5K screen, which is 500 nits and is overall a pretty nice looking screen. This is gonna fit the needs of someone who needs a desktop that doesn't need a crazy amount of performance and really doesn't want their desktop to take up too much space. It's basically if you want the M2 MacBook Air, but you don't wanna travel around with it. Because for the slightly higher end consumer, I would recommend the M1 Mac Mini. If we're being honest, a decent number of people aren't gonna be happy with the design of the iMac with those thick bezels and the non-height adjustable stand. But the Mac Mini is basically the solution to that. But you also have to account for the fact that the Mac Mini doesn't come with a monitor or a keyboard or a mouse. So let's assume that you pay like 600 for a monitor like the Dell U2720 Q, which is 4K, but it is also 27 inches because we at least have to try and match the display of the iMac. That would make the current total around $1,300, but then you also need a keyboard and a mouse. And we can do much better than the Apple Magic Keyboard and the Magic Mouse. So let's assume you get a mouse like the Logitech MX Master 2S, which is like 60 pounds right now, and it's still a really good deal, and a keyboard like the small MX Keys, which is like 100 pounds. But then the total now is $1,460 or pounds, which is significantly higher than the starting price of the M1 iMac. So this type of person that's buying a Mac Mini and can 
connecting it to their own display and their own keyboard and mouse should be a little more tech savvy than the average iMac buyer because it's probably going to be quite a bit more expensive. But then again, you are getting a much better experience aside from the computer with the new keyboard and the mouse and the display. But you also have to account for how much space this whole setup is probably going to take up. But if you don't care about how much space this whole setup is going to take up and you're in the market for a much, much bigger performance upgrade, the Mac Studio is probably going to be for you. If the Mac Mini is like the MacBook Air, the Mac Studio is the bigger, better, much better performing MacBook Pro. Because this is where you can start choosing between the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra chips, where the Ultra can go up to a 20 core CPU and a 64 core GPU. So clearly you need to have some pretty big performance demands for this. Because it does also start at $2,000, which is a lot of money. So most people probably won't need this computer because the performance that it gives is way overkill for most people. Unless you actually have a professional workflow, like you're a really hardcore video editor or photo editor. It's in the name. It's mainly for studio work, creative stuff, and really intensive file rendering. And the M1 Ultra version starts at $4,000, which is insanely expensive. So clearly this is getting into serious work territory. The M1 Ultra is basically described as two M1 Max chips in one chip, which I don't know if that automatically means that they can just double the price. But yeah, everything about the M1 Ultra Max Studio is doubled even the price. And that leaves what's meant to be the most powerful computer that Apple sells, and that's the Mac Pro. But the issue is, there's a little confusion about whether Apple actually just killed the Mac Pro by releasing the insanely powerful M1 Ultra chip in the form of the Mac Studio. And in a lot of workflows, maybe all of them, you should be getting a Mac Studio, not a Mac Pro. Now, most people who are watching this video probably aren't debating between a Mac Pro and a Mac Studio because these are really, really high-end computers. But Max Tech has a really good video where he compares like a $5,000-ish Mac Studio with M1 Ultra and like a $15,000 Mac Pro where the Mac Studio beat the Mac Pro in basically every test. Whether it was a CPU Geekbench test or the power usage test or the Red Raw or the ProRes export tests, the Mac Studio was destroying the Mac Pro that costed almost triple its cost. When it came to the graphics test, the Mac Studio did still win, but it was much closer. But there were some upgrades that the Mac Pro could have had to its graphics to maybe make it slightly better performing than the Mac Studio, just in terms of graphics. But that's a really unique use case. So for most people, if you're in this market, just get a Mac Studio. Okay, so I hope you found out which computer is for you, out of Apple's options at least. And maybe you got an idea on how much generally you should be spending. Big thanks for watching. It would be great if you could hit the subscribe button and I'll catch you guys in the next one.